So today we're going to kind of talk a little bit about the brain, how the brain works, what the brain does. Now, I'm, I'm a family practice physician, so I do primary care. And so you'll be getting kind of a little bit more of the generalist primary care aspect of it. And then when Dr. Kwaja comes up, she's going to give you a little bit more of the specialty aspect because she's a board-certified neurologist and specializes in sleep. So she'll kind of go over a little bit more of the details regarding sleep and the brain. But I'm just going to kind of lay a general overview of kind of you know, what, what, what do we want as far as brain activity? How do we, you know, optimize that? And what are things that we can do to generally kind of optimize the way our brain functions and the, bra and the way our brain works? One of the things is what can you do to help protect your brain? Well, you can wear a helmet like this lady, but I would not suggest that. That's not really a practical way to live your life. Uh, but there are some things that you can do in your everyday life to kind of protect your brain. A couple things that come through as far as what does the brain do and what is the purpose of the brain. And when we think about what the things the brain does, it's generally our system that makes sense out of all the information that's being processed. And when you're conscious or you're not conscious, it's constantly working. And it's working on several factors. So one of the factors that works is on memory, but it also works on an emotion level by kind of regulating how you feel, telling you feedback as far as what you think and perceiving your environment. It regulates things all the way from breathing to eating to sleeping. Um, to balance, to how you perceive things. And there's a whole set of books and interesting things about how the brain works and what are the perceptions of the brain and how it thinks. And a really interesting book is written by Oliver Sacks about um, how the brain works and kind of what different aspects and what kind of things do we get sensory-wise from the brain. And there's some really interesting research and literature coming out about the brain. What well, brain is one of those things that has been studied for a while, but we don't really know everything we need to know about it. But we do know a lot more, and especially in the last 10 to 15 years, we've come through with a lot of breakthroughs as far as understanding what is our brain responsible for. And when we react to certain situations, how much of that is mediated by certain pathways in our brain. We're going to get into a little bit more of that as the talk gets on. Disease is something that we always talk about in medicine as being kind of a very critical thing as far as how we understand our reaction and interaction with ourselves. And disease comes from, you know, a, a term from, you know, Middle English and French kind of dis-ease, generally meaning uh, a lack of ease. So generally meaning that something is wrong. So you can't relax. You can't go along with your normal state of existence. And when we talk about disease, it's usually a careful interaction between three very important pieces. One is your genetics. And so that's kind of basically what you're born with, your genes, your background, your makeup. That can't be changed. So that is unique to every individual because we are all different combinations of different genes from our parents and from you know, other ancestors. So that's one static piece, which is genetics. Another very important piece is environment. Now, environment, that is somewhat modifiable. So you can choose to live in Portland. You can choose to live in uh, New York City. You can choose to live in Chicago. Some people don't have control over their environment. They live in certain environments. The importance of the environment is if you live here in Portland, you're going to be exposed to a different set of diseases and illnesses than, say, if you lived in a tropical country, you'd be exposed to different diseases in a tropical country. Or if you lived in a big city with a lot of pollution, then you're going to be more exposed to getting diseases like asthma or bronchitis. So environment plays a key role. But one of the most important things that we actually do have control over when it comes to disease is um, our behavior. And so when it comes to behavior, that's kind of what are the things that we're doing generally to, to take care of ourselves. So are we exercising? Are we sleeping? You know, what, things, what kind of things are we eating? What is our diet consistent of? And behavior is something that we do have a little bit of control over. And so that's why I underlined it because I think it's key. When these three things interact, that is one of the main components of what kind of determines whether we're healthy or whether we're not. And so when we kind of take that approach and look at what sort of things can we control, what sort of things can we do, then we can start making better choices that will take care of our bodies and our brains. 
this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but this is just to exemplify what happens when the brain does not work correctly. And there's a, uh, there's a slew of diseases, and we could go on for pages and pages and pages of what happens to an individual's brain. When we just take the most basic aspects, so when we have memory deficits, we can have Alzheimer's disease, which is a form of dementia, um, which involves a lot of memory loss and difficulty making sense out of things. Taken to an extreme, it can lead to a lot of dysfunctional problems. But taken to uh, a milder version of that is what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is not exactly Alzheimer's, but kind of a pre-Alzheimer's type of a situation where you have some memory deficits, uh, but they don't exactly push you into having full-fledged Alzheimer's or full-fledged dementia, but you do have some decline in what we call cognitive function. And there's a set of tests that we can do over the course of time. There's been many tests that have been developed. One of them is the SLUM score. One of them is... Uh, the mini mental status exam. These are all different examinations that you can do to test uh, your memory and functionality. And it doesn't just test memory, it tests things like recall, it tests your ability to do math, your ability to put words together. So that uh, is a very important thing. And as we get older, sometimes our ability to be able to do some of these things gets a little bit compromised. So that's just one example. But then if we take a situation like movement, for example, that's a perfect example. You start having movement disorders, you can have things like Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is essentially kind of a difficulty with moving some of your muscles, but it comes from the brain, not from the muscle. And so there's a set of whole set of circumstances that you need to, to meet in order to diagnose that, but that's just an example of a movement disorder. And you can have problems with speech. So for example, uh, anything from a stro stroke to a speech impediment to various different things, can compromise your ability uh, to speak and your language capabilities. And then you can have things like emotions. So uh, running the whole gamut, you know, emotions can be affected by the way your brain works. And a good example of that is, you know, depression, anxiety, and taken all the way to the extreme, you can talk about, you know, um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. And these are all disorders that we have a good understanding of, but we don't have a complete grip on the pathophysiology. Why do some people get depressed and other people don't? What are the what are the exact circumstances? And like I said, it's probably a combination between genetics, environment, um, and behavior. But it's very important to keep that in mind that when we think about these diseases of the brain, we're talking about the entire person. And it, and basically, it's just more reflective of all of the things that the brain does. The brain does so many activities, and a compromise in any one of these activities can cause severe problems. So then the question comes up, if we know that we're at risk, or if we know that um, as we get older, you know, our risk of getting certain diseases you know, increases, well, what can we do to prevent that? And that's where I think it, it comes in very important to discuss two key aspects of prevention. And one of the things is diet. So I always tell my patients, if you think of your body like a car, okay, and it's got a gas tank, and you're, and you're going to fill up the gas tank, there's only two ways to modify how full that gas tank gets. Either you put in less gas, or you burn the gas that's in the gas tank. And so that's an input versus an output modification. So if you can modify what you eat, then you can modify... Uh, how much gas is in the tank. If you can burn off more, i.e. if you can exercise more, then you can burn that gas tank lower. There's really only two, two key ways to kind of look at weight loss. Now, I know if you watch TV at two in the morning, you know, there's always these commercials and, you know, people telling you, you know, buy this product and it's going to radically change your life. And, you know, you can go on eating four pizzas a day and, you know, never sleep and never exercise. And you can, you know, wear a size two or something, you know, th that's all just for public consumption. There's no real evidence to show that any of those things work. And frankly speaking, uh, some of those things are a little bit deceptive. You know, when it comes to actual healthy living, there's really only two things you can do is, di is modify your diet and modify your exercise. So then the question comes up what to eat, right? Which is always a very frustrating situation, which is, okay, you, you listen to the radio and you hear today somebody says, you know, uh, somebody did a study, it's usually of like 10 or 12 people and they found that eating some, 
you know, vegetable that you can't really get a hold of and people live till 95 years of age or something, you know. Uh, and that leads to this situation, which is like you start looking at your food and you start looking at things and you start getting incredibly frustrated because you don't know what you can eat and what you can't eat. So in the lay press, there is often a lot of citations of certain studies or things. And if you go back and look at what the studies were and the study design and how they came to those conclusions, y you, might call, you might pause a little bit when you hear something like that. Because there has to be kind of, in order to kind of make good dietary recommendations, it's good to remember that something should have a lot of evidence. There should be a lot of data and research about it. It shouldn't just be one study. It shouldn't just be one thing. And when you look at and we'll go through when we talk about diet, there are just some common themes and there's certain models that you can use that will help make sense and guide you a little bit in choosing what's the appropriate diet for you. And I will tell you, I'm not a, a particular person that says you have to eat this particular diet or you know this is the only diet that's gonna be good for you. I think there, diets are just models. They're just different ways for us to explain and some of them are culturally based and some of them are based on individuals but a, a diet should be a diet that you feel comfortable with and that makes sense for you. One model for uh, a diet that could be good for the brain is what's called the Mediterranean diet. Now, this is a diet that's been popularized, you know, uh, Mediterranean countries, particularly Italy. People use this as kind of a stereotypical diet. It's hard when you're talking about the Mediterranean diet to actually pin down what's the definition of a Mediterranean diet because there's so many different, you know, definitions. But generally, if you think about it, what a Mediterranean diet is, it's high in fr fresh fruits and vegetables. So salads, fresh fruits, those type of things tend to be consumed pretty, pretty highly in that diet. There also tends to be a liberal use of whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. So that's where a lot of people get their proteins from, from those type of things. But there also tends to be a liberal use of olive oil and lean meat. So lean meats are things like fish and chicken. Uh, these have certain fats in them, certain components in them that have been shown to be healthy for the brain in particular. And there is a, a, a moderate alcohol consumption as well. And we're going to get through, we're going to go through each one of these things a little bit to give you some more detail about what's healthy about these things and what's not. Again, the Mediterranean diet is the one that's been shown to have the best protective effect for the brain. And in general, there's some themes in there that I think even if you aren't going to follow a pure Mediterranean diet, you're going to get a lot of benefit from just integrating some of these things into your daily diet. So this is a nice one because it's a little food pyramid, you know, design, you know, breaking down what the Mediterranean diet is. And you see on the bottom, you know, fairly, you know, healthy dose of olive oil and pastas and whole grain type of foods. And then as you kind of go up, you know, you get a little bit more of the fresh fruits and vegetables and you get a little bit more nuts. And as you kind of go up and up and up and you see at the very top is the sweets. So, um, you know, sugary stuff is not something that's been... Uh, shown to be very necessarily healthy for you, and it's not something that's been in the Mediterranean diet as well. If we look at the Mediterranean diet, and what, what's, the, what's the medical evidence? What, what's the data show on the Mediterranean diet? And there is a lot of good research on what are the positive aspects of Mediterranean diet. And certainly we know that for brain health, it can be very healthy, particularly for Alzheimer's prevention. The other thing is that it's very important is your risk of heart attack and stroke, which are generally aggregated into a group of uh, things called cardiovascular disease. So that's actually been shown to be uh, much less in folks that follow the Mediterranean diet, including Parkinson's disease, another brain disorder, and certain cancers have also been shown to be uh, particularly low amongst those that consume the Mediterranean diet. Now, one of the other things that's nice is that Mediterranean diet consumers tend to live a longer life, too. So there's a lot of things that are beneficial to following the Mediterranean diet. And then the question that comes up is, which foods specifically are good for you? Now, you kind of have a general idea of which foods are generally good following a Mediterranean diet. What are some, like you know, high impact foods that you know will be generally healthy for you. Well, we know berries are very good, and particularly strawberries and blueberries. And particularly part of the reason why they're very good for you is they have high flavonoids. And in those flavonoids are a lot of antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties, which tend to have show that the brain, you know, protect the brain. 
And we know that these things are very good because lots of people have done data on studying folks who eat that, how they eat it, and the relationship between that food and the brain. The other thing I think that's important to remember in the Mediterranean diet is whole grains. So whole grains are good for you, yes, for your brain health, but they're also very good for you for your overall gastrointestinal health. So we know high fiber diets, people who consume high fiber diets almost always have decreased rates of breast cancer, colon cancer, decreased constipation rates, decreased hemorrhoid rates. So we know that high fiber foods are generally good. And there's several theories as to why the fiber is good for you. Uh, one of the theories is postulated is that as you eat more fibrous foods, it gets you full faster, so then you're less likely to eat unhealthy things. The other idea is that the fiber in there helps stimulate your gastrointestinal system and allows food to move in more quickly. And the other uh, theory is that eating fiber foods kind of draws the fats and the other things in your food out so it doesn't get absorbed and you, uh, you evacuate it instead. One of the other things that always comes up is alcohol consumption. So I always get this from my patients. So, so how much can I drink, right? Um, we live in Portland, so Portland is very, uh, a very nice place to, to be able to imbibe in certain beverages, you know. So um, the question always comes up is, well, how much should I drink? And how much can I drink? And what's safe? And instead of looking at things from good and bad, because I really try to avoid using things like, oh, that's good or that's bad, I try to look at things from healthy versus unhealthy. So at what point is your alcohol consumption getting unhealthy? So looking at literature throughout all countries, and the nice thing about alcohol is it's something that's universally consumed throughout the world. So all cultures, all people have some form of alcohol that they consume. And so we can do a lot of data and literature, and some great literature and data is coming out of the Scandinavian countries and the European countries regarding alcohol consumption. And one of the things that comes up is how much is, uh, how much is safe and how much is good. Well, we know for females, about one drink a day and no more than about seven drinks a week. Now, this is just an average, okay? It's like this is when we're talking about how much should I drink to be healthy. So just an average, one drink a day, seven, so, you know, about seven drinks a week. For males, it's a little bit higher, so it's about one to two drinks. You know, you can have two drinks a day uh, and about 14 drinks a week. And so when you think about that, that is what's safe alcohol consumption. But that doesn't necessarily mean you get carte blanche to go drink as much as you want, or it doesn't mean that everyone should be doing this. And I think that's the key. If you have a history of addiction, this does not apply because then the negative aspects of regular alcohol consumption far outweigh the positive aspects that you may get from alcohol consumption. The other thing is if you have certain medical conditions like a liver problem or you're on certain medications that interact with alcohol, then it would probably be worse for you to drink. Another thing is if there's a strong family history of addiction, there may be a reason to think okay, this is probably not for me. So I think that's a good conversation to always have with your physician is how much should I drink and am I one of those people that uh, can do this safely? And I think that's, uh, that always gets into a tricky thing with, with the family history and with your personal history and that's something where it's best to kind of talk with your physician about. But the key to remember with alcohol consumption is alcohol does have calories. And so if you're going to drink one or two drinks you know, a day, you have to, you have to make up for those calories somewhere. You have to be, you have to count those. So, you know, when you're thinking a uh, calorie scale, you know, what's, what's healthy, what's not, you know, a glass of wine probably has about 90 calories, you know, a nice, uh, rich stout beer or porter or something's got 180, you know, a regular beer, Pilsner probably has about a hundred, you know, so y you have to kind of make up for that. So if you know you're going to have a hundred calories or 200 calories extra, uh, with your alcohol consumption, then you need to make sure that you either deduct that or burn more off later on. And this is the, the aspect that I wanted to emphasize is that the Mediterranean diet is just one model. You know, it's just a model that helps explain, uh, and gives people a little bit of guidance over what are healthy choices. Uh, but I think there is, or there are a universal set of, of things that are healthy, whether you follow the Mediterranean diet or not. And I think these are very, very important things for particularly the American diet, which is sugars need to be consumed in moderation. And one of the major things that we get into is packaged foods. And if you actually look at 
the contents that are in your packaged foods. You'll see a lot of high fructose corn syrup. You'll see a lot of added sugars, sodas, those type of things. Those can be quite detrimental, and those can have not only high calories, but the quality of calories you're getting is not particularly good. So being a little bit cognizant of what type of things uh, you're eating and what kind of sugars you're getting exposed to. Generally, another adage that people say is that if food comes out of a box, it's probably not the best for you. So uh, anything that you got to heat up and then you eat right out of the microwave or, you know, you, 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 you pick it up and it comes in a box is generally probably not that good. And, and the reason for that is processed foods. One of the biggest things that we always get in trouble with with processed foods is the unaccounted calories. And, and one of the ways that I know on a personal level why it's very interesting, in California, of several years ago, when my family's from, uh, they passed this law where you have, to, you have to list the calories on everything that you get. You know? And that's all coming you know, nationwide over some time. But uh, several years ago, I remember going back and going to a fast food place or something, and they had to list the calories, and it's amazing how much calories are in certain things. Uh, you know, sometimes just, you know, a uh, latte at Starbucks, you know, can have as much as 400 calories in it. So you've got to be cognizant of those calories, and the liquid calories can be some of the biggest uh, offenders. Now, limiting soft drinks, obviously, like I said, is something very, very important because of the sugars that are involved in that. But then... The other thing I think is important is thinking about your portion sizes. And, and thinking about your portion sizes is one way because that looks at content, but also looking at frequency. So how much are you eating? You know, it's not healthy to, in order to lose weight, to skip eating breakfast or to skip eating dinner. It's better to eat on a regular schedule and eat more frequent regular meals than less frequent large meals. And portion sizes are an important aspect of that because if you limit your portion sizes and you eat, kind of regular meals, then you won't get into the issue of being really hungry and then overeating. And that's to get to this point, which is starving yourself is not a diet, you know? So this, this picture of this lady saying, you know, I have a condition that prevents me from dieting. It's called being freaking hungry, you know? And I think that's the thing is that you cannot starve yourself. You got to be able to eat and you got to eat regularly. It's just about making healthy choices when you do eat. There's always a competition between tobacco use and exercise, you know, but I would probably say the single most important thing that an individual can do for their health is not smoke tobacco or chew tobacco or use any tobacco products because we know that tobacco has significantly high risk of various disorders for the body. We know that tobacco smokers do you have a higher risk of the obvious, right? Lung cancer, asthma, emphysema, COPD, those type of disorders, that's kind of a given. But when you talk about heart attack, you talk about stroke, you talk about those type of things, there is an extremely high risk when you smoke versus when you don't smoke. And what I like to do with my patients is I often go through and do this, uh, there's this thing called the 10-year coronary artery disease risk calculator. And that's basically what guides us when you get your cholesterol checked to decide what's an acceptable cholesterol level. What I like to do that is one of the questions on there is, do you smoke tobacco? And it's amazing, like when you, do, when you do the calculation and you put in the result, and if you say yes on smoke tobacco, what their risk of a heart attack is in 10 years, and if you say no, what the risk is, and it's significantly different. I mean, you can cut your, your depending on what risk level you are, but you can cut your risk of having a heart attack down by three or four times by just, by just doing one thing, which is quitting tobacco use. And we know that tobacco is a big problem. And in Sweden, when they, when they studied a very large group of people, it's about 10,000 people, and they found out that 39% of the strokes, tobacco was responsible for that, you know? And then we do know that when you do quit smoking, within two to four years, your body heals itself up pretty good. Now, the, now it all depends on how much exposure you had, but generally, if you can quit smoking within two to four years, your risk of having cardiovascular disease can be cut down pretty significantly. Then we get into lifestyle activities, right? And I always like these pictures with the dogs, because especially this one on the end, because I think that's like pretty hilarious watching a dog do yoga. But I think when we talk about lifestyle activities, we generally look at it three groups. And I think sometimes we use this idea of exercise. We use this generic term called exercise. And I want you to think about activity. And I want you to redefine those things into three activity zones. And 
We're going to talk about mental activity. We're going to talk about social activity. And we're going to talk about physical activity. So all of these dogs are doing, you know, you have the dog reading, you got the dog in the in their group, and then you have the one doing yoga. So I think it's very good to think about brain health and think about activities that you can do to keep your brain healthy. When it comes to mental activities, I think this is one of the key aspects. Now, memory training, memory cues, organizational aids, we know that those things do improve people's uh, memory. And we have good data and study to show that when people use those things over the course of time, their memory declines at a lower rate than people who don't. We also know that exercising your brain is key. And I'm not one of these people that says you got to do this particular activity. I think you've got to find the activity that you feel like is stimulating for your brain. For some people, it's reading. For some people, it's writing. For some people, it's art. For some people, it's quiet reflection. Whatever your Whatever, whatever fits your lifestyle and your values and your beliefs and whatever works best for you, I think is the best uh, type of activity that you can do. And the same goes for everything else. I think whatever you can fit into your lifestyle and that works for you is going to be the best thing that you can do. We do know that staying socially engaged is very important. And we do know that as people stay more socially engaged, they tend to have their memory and other things like that decline less. And part of that is that we as human beings are social uh, social animals, we're social beings. Even someone who's introverted is not gonna do well in pure sensory desperation. We need some sort of social interaction between people. And so we do know that isolation tends to make a lot of these things worse. So trying to be engaged with friends and family is very important. Even things like volunteering in your local community or having a group of people that gets together and doing activities, um, these are all things that I think are important models or different examples of things we can do. Whether you have a large family, you have a small family, whether you have lots of friends or you don't have friends, Whatever the situation is, I think finding a way to stay socially engaged is helpful and actually does help the brain stay active and stay at tip-top shape. Now, physical activity, I think, is also really key, and there's always this question of how much physical activity am I supposed to get? And I think that is that that is a very good question because I have patients say, well, how much am I supposed to get? Am I supposed to get five minutes a day? Am I, I read on the radio, they said 20 minutes. They said this, they said that. And I just want you to remember one number, 150 minutes. So 150 minutes of exercise in a week is considered healthy. And the reason why it's considered healthy is it will prevent pretty much everything. So if you have 150 minutes of exercise a week, you're talking about decreased risk of stroke, heart attack, diabetes, bone loss, depression. I mean, if you can think about one thing that... Uh, we are sus- you know, susceptible to, there's nothing that exercise actually doesn't help with. And so 150 minutes of kind of you know, moderate exercise. If you're talking about you know, you know, uh, pretty vigorous exercise, so it's about you know, uh, 75 minutes a week. But I always try to tell folks, you know, start off slow, start off easy. And the nice thing a lot about that 150 minutes is it doesn't matter how you get it. So you can get that 150 minutes all in one day, or you can get that spread out over the week. It doesn't matter. Now, there is issues with you know, exercising two and a half hours all of a sudden on one day you know, for overuse injuries and those type of things. But... In general, the the trick of it is, is it's averaged over a week. So all you need to do is get that 150 minutes. And that's kind of a magic number. And for those of us that are busy, and sometimes I tell my patients, just park 10 minutes farther, you know, park at the end of the parking lot. You walk 10 minutes to your car, or you walk from 10 minutes extra from from your car to your job, and then you walk 10 minutes back, that's 20 minutes right there. Go for a 10 minute walk during your lunch break, that's 30 minutes right there. You've just you've just taken a huge step toward getting to that 150 minutes. So even little things, and and I feel like we often build ourselves up to saying exercise means you gotta go to the gym and you gotta lift, you know, bench press 300 pounds and you gotta jog eight miles a day. That's not exercise. That's a form of exercise for some people, but that's not necessarily for everyone. So you need to individualize what you do. It also doesn't matter what kind of exercise you do. You can do yoga, you can do walking, you can do weightlifting, you can do 
running. You can pretty much do anything. All of that counts. And so if you think of that 150 minutes as a guideline, it'll help you. This does not count as exercise. And this is one of my favorite pictures ever, which is somebody taking the escalator to get into a 24-hour fitness um, thing. And I always thought that was just really funny because, you know, they're going to the gym, but then they're taking the escalator up. So this definitely does not count. And then I always like this picture too. Does running late count as exercise? And no, it does not count as exercise. One of the things that I wanted to go over was uh, how does activity work, you know, and how does it work on the brain? And this is a little bit of what we call pathophysiology. So how does the brain work and, and, and how are these things that we're doing, how are they effective and how are they helpful? And I think there's three general theories as far as why these kind of activities are helpful or these kind of activities, kind of diets, these type of things are helpful for us, with, you know, for our brain. One of them is called the cognitive reserve hypothesis. And this gets behind the issue of, you'll see it in the literature and, and even in the lay press a little bit, there's a whole concept about neuroplasticity. And the idea behind neuroplasticity is essentially there's connections in the brain, and by you doing good things to help or doing healthy things to help with the connections in the brain, you improve the function and the pathways for the neurons that are functioning in your brain, and in that process you get better brain performance. That's just one example to kind of explain that. Another, another hypothesis regarding why these activities are good for us is called the vascular hypothesis. So this is essentially that our brain is, is, uh, is being replenished constantly every minute, every second, by our blood vessels. So by us exercising, we are improving the performance of the blood vessels in our brain, we're improving the performance of the blood vessels in our heart, and overall then we're leading a healthier life. The other idea is, is another hypothesis is the stress hypothesis. hypothesis. And this is the concept that Outside stress is what really leads to poor performance and leads to us having disease. And anything we can do to help decrease that outside stress will improve our performance with our brain. And the idea is that by exercising, by staying socially engaged, by uh, doing mental activities, you're doing all of these things to decrease the stress load on your brain. And by decreasing that stress load, your brain is going to better function. I like to go over this just because it's it's a nice theoretical understanding of why why are we suggesting these things and what is the delicate and complex interaction that's happening that's actually giving us uh, some benefit. I just wanted to kind of give a quick summary slide, which is a healthy diet goes a long way. And what I think is important in this is if you want to follow the Mediterranean diet, I am 100% in favor of you doing that. If you want to look at your diet that you're doing right now and try to make some modifications, I think that is excellent too. We all have to start at a different place. Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that. You know, So when you're thinking about your diet, use different models, use different things that might motivate you to try to make healthier choices with your diet. I think alcohol consumption in moderation is very good. Uh, for certain people, you know, uh, but I think that that there is good evidence to, sh to show that and I think not smoking is very important and one of the things about tobacco use is in the state of Oregon, we actually have a very nice program. We have the Oregon Quit Line. So anytime a patient, and you don't have to go to your doctor to access the Oregon Quit Line, but you can, but anytime you need to, get, anytime an individual is interested in quitting smoking, you can call the Oregon Quit Line. It's free and they supply you with patches, gums, meds, all for free. And so um, it's an excellent program, and it's, it's designed very well. And what they do is they check your insurance to see what you qualify for, and basically they try to find a way to work with you to help quit. And I think that's an important resource that we have. And I think the other thing is activity. So activity is defined as mental activity, but activity is defined as social um, engagement, and go into that 150 minutes uh, a week of exercise. You can definitely get toward better brain health there. These are just some tips and tools uh, that I think are helpful, uh, but they are generally kind of nice things that we can do to kind of help mitigate our risk and improve our quality of life and then overall have our brain uh, function in a better uh, and healthier way. And I'm gonna hand the uh, microphone to Dr. Kwaja.
Well, I'm glad to be here and glad to see such a great turnout on a sunny day for that matter. So I'm happy to be away from that seat because I was sitting right underneath the vent and freezing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna, I'm going to take off my neurology hat for a little bit and put on my sleep medicine hat. And I hope to take the next 30 minutes to make you little sleep experts um, and learn about sleep, what it entails, uh, how do we regulate sleep, and how sleep and poor, uh, poor sleep and sleep deprivation can really impact our memory, our mood, and our level of stress, and vice versa. So why do we focus so much attention on sleep? We've, sleep has received so much media attention. We're always trying to keep our heads above water and we're so busy with our lives that we tend to neglect sleep and tend to sacrifice our sleep. But sleep is an important function and it's required uh, for survival. They've done a lot of studies on rats and they've found that rats that were deprived of sleep died within two to three weeks of continued sleep deprivation. And rats with any amount of sleep debt uh, actually lived five months compared to their normal life expectancy of two to three years. Um, humans that have been deprived of sleep for hours or days can become actually paranoid and hallucinogenic. Uh, and a lot of uh, auto debts, up to 100,000 a year, are attributed to sleepy driving. And that's a higher number, higher percentage of number um, in, in, in teens and adolescents. So why focus so much on sleep? Well, we spend a third of our lives sleeping, um, so it's important. Sleep is an active process. Uh, there's actually not an organ uh, or regulatory system that actually shuts down sleep. Um, in fact, uh, aside from a, a slight decrease in our metabolic rate, uh, a lot of our brain activities can increase in sleep, particularly our delta waves, so those are our slow wave or deep sleep. Uh, many parts of our brains are actually just as active as they are in wakefulness, and that's particularly true in our dreaming stage of sleep or our REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. Um, so we dream about two hours a night, meaning that we spend about two hours uh, of sleep in REM sleep. There's also specific hormones that increase during sleep. So melatonin is very important. That triggers the onset of sleep. Uh, and growth hormone is very important. And this is important in adolescence because we always complain about our teenagers sleeping so much. Well, they need it. This is when growth hormone is really being released. And this is important for their uh, puberty and growth spurts. And there's also specific cues for the regulation of sleep. So when we talk about uh, the regulator of sleep uh, and our internal clock, we're really talking about what's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or the SCN, it's a big term. Uh, it's located in the hypothalamus of the brain, so deep in the brain. Uh, and it's our internal clock or central oscillator. It gets a lot of external input. So input, the main input is actually light. Uh, and then, but there's also input from our food, temperature, act, our level of activity. All of those external inputs go into this internal clock. The internal clock kind of churns it out and then sends signals to the rest of the body uh, to either signal or regulate our sleep or promote wakefulness. But then we're also sending signals to our other organs of our body. So uh, one of the important tissues in our body is our cardiovascular tissue. So the circadian rhythm and the internal clock is actually helping uh, our heart determine vascular tone and contractility, our heart rate and our blood pressure. Uh, this is also the way our gut controls our motility and absorption of nutrients through the gut. Um, and the pancreas, for example, uh, releases insulin and glucagon through, uh, through the circadian rhythm and the internal clock. So all of these, they're not in whole uh, regulated by the circadian rhythm, but partly. So this is a normal circadian rhythm. So in a normal individual, uh, melatonin secretion, which usually signals sleep, begins around nine o'clock. Within a couple of hours of that, uh, patients are, or individuals are typically falling asleep. Uh, by 2 a.m., so that's about two hours or so after somebody's actually fallen asleep, we really attain our deepest sleep. Um, around 4.30 a.m., we start getting uh, a decline, and it's our lowest body temperature. And our, when our body temperature is the lowest, that actually signals the release of cortisol, or our stress hormone in the body. And that's a signal to the body that it's actually time to rise. And cortisol kind of falls in a bell curve. And so when it's starting to rise, by, by the time it peaks, that's when you're really actually waking up. Uh, and that happens to be around 6.30 in the morning or so. And that's when you see the sharpest rise in blood pressure. This is also why, because of the increase, slow increase in cortisol, we see that the most of heart attacks and strokes tend to happen early in the morning. 
and there's actually a reason behind it. Um, melatonin secretion typically stops around 7.30, and then we're most alert a couple of af hours after awakening, so around 10 o'clock. And then, you know, the day progresses, and by the evening hours, we've really uh, reached our highest blood pressure, and that's usually by 6 p.m., and then the cycle kind of restarts. So what are our, everybody has a pattern of sleep. Um, our sleep architecture, so to speak, varies from person to person, um, depending on our underlying physiology and our, whether we have a sleep disorder or not. This pattern or architecture varies, but overall, most patients will have four, or most individuals will have four stages of sleep during a normal night. Um, that used to be five stages of sleep, but they've changed the nomenclature in the last few years. So we have stage one, two, three, which is your non-REM or non-dreaming stage sleep. Uh, and then you have your REM sleep or your dreaming sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, during your non-REM sleep, this is when a lot of your restorative functions of sleep are happening. So memories and thoughts from the day are being processed. Uh, these, the way the cycle progresses is you start from stage one, go to stage two, three, and then to REM, and then the cycle kind of re-begins. Each cycle is about 90 to 120 minutes, and we have about three to five cycles of the, these a night. Um, the first few cycles actually have pretty short periods of REM, and then REM progressively gets longer, sorry, as the time goes on. So this is a good depiction of kind of what's happening. So we're starting up here in wakefulness, and we're slowly coming down stage one, stage two, stage three. And this is an older slide because it has four stages in there. But you're finally reaching your deep sleep, and then you go back up into your first REM period. And as you can see, your dreaming stage or REM sleep is getting progressively longer. But the other thing that you'll notice is that you're getting less and less of the stage three and stage four old nomenclature of stage four sleep, which is your deep sleep. So deep sleep kind of tapers off, but your REM sleep actually gets much more um, prominent. So what happens during these stages of sleep? So stage one is your light sleep. This is when you're just drifting off to sleep. You're starting to see these slow eye movements. Eyes are kind of roving. Um, this is also when you feel those, what are called hypnic jerks. So when you uh, get that sensation like you're falling and your body kind of jerks or twitches. Uh, this is exactly when that's happening. Uh, stage two sleep, things start to kind of shut down. Heart rate slows down. Um, uh, your your uh, brain is doing less complicated tasks. You may have a few fast waves in there, and these are called your sleep spindles, and you may see that throughout when we do a sleep study. Your stage three sleep is really your deep sleep. Uh, this is where the hormones are being released, or growth hormone and things of that sort. Um, this is also where some of the sleep disorders are all seen. So things like sleepwalking, night terrors in children, um, bedwetting. This is the st typical stage of sleep when all of that occurs. And then you get to into REM sleep. So what's happening in REM sleep? Uh, like I said, it's a very active state of sleep. Um, uh, if you weren't, it's very close to wakefulness, if, uh, for that matter. Uh, most people usually can remember their dreams if they're awoken from uh, REM sleep. Uh, and most dreams do occur in REM sleep, but not exclusively in REM sleep. Uh, there's an increase in heart rate and blood pressure and breathing rate during REM sleep compared to other stages. Um, your eyes have this rapid jerking, and that's why it's called rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, and there's loss of temperature regulation. Uh, men may have erections spontaneously during REM sleep. We typically have about three to five intervals of REM sleep because of the three to five cycles that we have in our sleep. Adults spend about half of their time actually in stage two sleep, uh, whereas in infants, half that time is spent in REM sleep. Uh, we only spend as adults about 25% of our time in REM sleep, so about two hours in an eight hour period. And this is, uh, this is the jerky eye movements. These are eye leads that we put on a patient when we do a sleep study. And you can kind of see these erratic eye movements. They're not in synchrony. They're kind of all over the place. Um, and that's characteristic of REM sleep. That's how it gets its name. So there's a lot of changes that happen as we age in our sleep. Um, the biggest change and the biggest misconception that a lot of patients will come in and they'll say, well, I'm older, so I'm not getting as much REM sleep. Well, it's actually not true. Uh, there is a decline in REM sleep as you get older, uh, but as you can see that the percentage of REM is not all that diminished. The biggest thing that we actually notice that patients get older is that their slow wave sleep or their deep sleep, stage three sleep, is actually what takes a big hit. Stage one or their stage two or lighter sleep tends to actually increase a little bit to compensate for that difference. 
The other important thing is this num this thing right here, WASO. Um, it's a sleep term for wakefulness after sleep onset. So it's, it's an indic indication of how many times or how many minutes you spend awake after you've fallen asleep. And that's the number that actually increases as you get older. And that basically just shows that as you get older, you have very inefficient sleep. You're spending a lot of time and having more awakenings uh, in the middle of the night and more interruptions. So how much sleep do we really need? Well, as newborns, up to 18 hours a day. Um, if only we could do that as adults. Uh, as toddlers, we're looking at about 12 to 14 hours. Uh, School-aged children, so 10 to 11. And then teenagers, anywhere from eight, to eight and a half to nine and a half or so. Uh, most adults, ideally, should get up to eight or nine hours, but seven and a half to eight hours is usually sufficient for us to function well. 10% uh, of us require either more or less sleep compared to that. And then pregnant women tend to need more sleep. So there's, there's been a lot of, a multitude of studies that have looked at uh, how we as Americans are doing when it comes to measuring up to the sleep, uh, sleep requirement. And basically the trend is over the years from 1998 till you know, at least 2005, uh, the tr and this is just getting worse, is that the percentage of patients getting less than seven hours of sleep is increasing, and the percentage of people getting more than eight hours of sleep is actually decreasing. So it basically just translate to increased sleep debt and more sleep deprivation for all of us. And, and this is very, it, it, the numbers are really alarming. There's 50% of Americans that are actually sleep deprived. 30% uh, average less than six hours a night. Um, seven out of 10 people have trouble sleeping. Um, a third of Americans have some sort of symptom of insomnia. And so 60 million uh, of those actually suffer from some chronic insomnia or long-term disorder, and 20 million have transient symptoms or occasional symptoms. So what are our con contributors to sleep? First and foremost, we're just not going to bed. We're spending a lot of time doing other activities. We're too busy uh, helping the children with their homework, doing chores after they've gone to sleep, uh, whatever it may be, we're just, just not going to bed. And then if we are going to bed, we're just not spending enough time in bed. Um, we're we have this, as Americans, very, this very have-to-be-productive mentality um, and the attitude that, you know, I don't need that much sleep. Um, I, I'm just somebody that functions at a lower level. And that may, part of that may be true. And then also uh, poor sleep hygiene. And we'll cover this in a little bit more detail later, but I'll, be, I'll mention my two biggest pet peeves in clinic, and that's using electronics in bed and pets in bed. As far as electronics, about 95% of people use some type of electronic, uh, whether it be iPod, iPad, um, any of the Apple products, uh, about an hour before bed. Um, young adults are notorious for, uh, for doing this, and about 52% of them, I think, text before bed, sometime before bed, about an hour before bed, compared to 5% of baby boomers. Um, people who text before bed uh, were likely to not get a good night's sleep, wake up more tired, be characterized by others as being sleepy, and were more likely to drive while drowsy. Now, as far as pets in bed, so there's been several surveys done. There's been no formal studies, per se, but surveys. And the Mayo Clinic uh, actually found that 53% of people who slept with a pet said that their animals do disturb their sleep. And the bottom line is that pets just don't have the same sleep schedule that humans do um, and, and should probably be in their own bed. Um, there's some misconception, I'll touch upon alcohol. Um, a, lot of, a lot of my patients will come in and say, well, I just can't sleep unless I have a glass of wine before bed, or I need my one shot of gin and tonic or something right before bed. Um, and alcohol, moderate use is okay, um, but using alcohol as a sleep aid uh, is actually not a good idea. Uh, initially, you may find that it helps you fall asleep. So the first quarter or half of the night, you may be doing okay. But as the alcohol is being metabolized, uh, you're starting to see much more awakenings and sleep fragmentation. So your sleep efficiency for the rest of the night is actually very poor. And actually, there's been a lot of studies looking at alcoholics and uh, their incidence of insomnia, and it's actually tremendous. And even for patients that have given up alcohol, uh, years after they're in recovery, uh, they still uh, deal with insomnia. And actually, there's a recent paper that came out that said uh, that their re rate of relapse was directly correlated to their uh, degree of insomnia. 
Uh, sleep disorders can also contribute to poor sleep, so sleep apnea. Um, this is not really a talk about sleep disorders, but sleep apnea, insomnia, restless legs, this, is, this can all contribute to difficulty falling asleep and staying asleep. So what is the, the impact of poor sleep? Um, according to, and I'll give you some statistics, According to the Institute of Medicine, over a million injuries and 50,000 to 100,000 deaths resulted from some sort of preventable medical error. And many of these uh, were thought to be the result of poor sleep. Uh, insomnia costs the average American about $2,200 in lost productivity each year, but if we add up all the American workers, that number is $63 billion, uh, all attributed to insomnia and poor sleep. Uh, about 60% of adult drivers have admitted to driving while sleepy, uh, and more than a third of adult drivers have actually fallen asleep at the wheel. And the National Traffic uh, Safety Administration actually, and I think I touched upon this earlier, was that 100,000 police reported crashes were the direct result uh, of driver fatigue each year. Uh, aside from work-related and, uh, and traffic uh, accidents, uh, poor grades and school performance in children can be attributed to sleep debt and poor sleep. Increased anger, fear, sadness, uh, and mood issues, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and then also decreased ability in controlling your emotions and behavior. Uh, decreased ability to focus, sit still, complete work. In fact, there's been a, a direct correlation between the incidence of ADHD in children and also sleep, poor sleep. Uh, increased use of stimulants, uh, developing the Starbucks habit, and relying more on caffeine and nicotine to stay awake. Uh, because of poor sleep. There's also uh, a lot of uh, medical uh, links between poor sleep uh, and, for example, the increased incidence of breast cancer and colorectal cancer in patients that are uh, sleep deprived or have poor sleep. In women, you may see increased rate of spontaneous abortions, low birth weight, prematurity if they're sleep deprived. Uh, the biggest correlation is cardiovascular disease. There's actually a 40% increased risk of chest pain, hypertension, and uh, coronary artery disease in patients that have sleep deprivation or poor sleep. So sleep and memory. Sleep has a, plays a huge role in the consolidation of memory. It is essential for us to learn and process new information and retrieve old information. Uh, the exact mechanism isn't quite known, but researchers have hypothesized that specific, there's certain specific characteristics of brain waves uh, in different stages may play a role in the types of memories that are, that are being processed. So when we talk about, um, and I'll kind of just briefly cover this, but um, there's two types of memory, short-term, long-term memory. Under long-term memory, you have uh, declarative memory or explicit memory. This is your general knowledge, your facts, knowing that bananas are yellow, there's 12 months in a year. Uh, these are your personal experiences, remembering childhood friends, things of that sort. Under your non-declarative memory, you're really looking at conditioned responses and also your procedural memory. So knowing how to drive a car, knowing how to ride a bike, things of that sort. Um, the, the biggest stage of sleep that plays a role in sleep consolidation and memory ends up being REM sleep. Uh, there's been a few studies recently that came out that talked about stage three or deep sleep, uh, but by far REM sleep takes home the award. Um, it's an essential role for a consolidation and acquisition of learned material. There's actually been one research study where individuals were asked to engage in this very intensive language, language course, and they studied their sleep and did a sleep study the following night and found that they had a substantial increase in REM sleep. Um, there's been some studies that have actually suggested that maybe REM sleep is really involved if the, pro if the memory is more complex or emotionally charged as opposed to being very simple or emotionally neutral. And then REM sleep does play a huge role uh, in procedural memory, so us learning and remembering how to do certain tasks. What happens when we are sleep deprived uh, to our learning and our performance? Well, our focus, our attention, uh, our vigilance definitely decreases. Uh, it's difficult for us to receive and process the information. Um, we have a hard time making sound decisions. Our judgment is, becomes a little bit more impaired. We can't assess our situations that we're in accurately. Um, we also, it also negatively impacts our mood, which again affects our ability to acquire and learn uh, new information. There's also 
also some conflicting things in research too, however, um, that argue against the poss that uh, the argue against REM sleep playing such a big role. For example, there are certain medications that we prescribe our patients that actually suppress REM sleep. Antidepressants are notorious for that. Uh, a lot of antidepressants will suppress REM sleep, but in those patients, um, not all of them are coming back to clinic complaining of having. Um, memory issues. So, you know, that kind of makes us think, well, is REM sleep really that critical? Um, also, there's been, there's certain injuries or disease processes that can lower your REM sleep. So patients that have strokes involving, or structural injuries to the brain involving uh, a part of the brain that regulates REM sleep, again, they're not necessarily complaining about memory problems. So there's more to this than just REM sleep, uh, and we still have to figure all of this out. So insufficient sleep, we all know that if we have had a poor night of sleep, we're cranky, we're irritable, um, very moody, we, we're easily frustrated, um, our motivation is poor, uh, and children, sometimes it's the opposite. Instead of being tired and looking sleepy, they may be really hyperactive. Um, and so it just depends on the person. Um, there has been a direct correlation between our, um, the amount of sleep and our sleep de deprivation and also our mood. Uh, in fact, chronic insomnia may increase our risk of developing depression and anxiety. Uh, in insomnia has been shown to be a reliable predictor of depression. And in fact, 15 to 20 percent of people diagnosed with insomnia will actually develop major depressive disorder. Uh, in one study, about 10,000 people with insomnia were found to be five times more likely to develop depression um, than, than the control group. There was also uh, an increased risk of anxiety in patients with lack of sleep. About 20 times, patients with insomnia are 20 times more likely to develop uh, panic disorder or anxiety disorder. There's been a University of Pennsylvania study that found that subjects who were limited to only four and a half hours of sleep uh, a night for one week reported feeling stressed, angry, sad, mentally exhausted. And the minute they were allowed to recover and go back to their normal sleeping habits, all those mood symptoms reversed or changed. Uh, Inversely, mood and, and, and our mental states can affect our sleep. Um, so it's not just poor sleep affecting our mood, that, that could, there can be an inverse relationship there as well. Uh, difficulty sleeping can be the first symptom sometimes of depression, especially in our older population. Uh, anxiety also increases agitation and arousal. So a lot of patients with anxiety have difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep because they're having these racing thoughts in the middle of the night. They can't just shut off their brain. Um, stress also affects um, our, body, our sleep by making our body more aroused, awake, and alert. And so we're just in this constant state of stress and we're unable to really turn things off. So I just, in preparation for the talk, I Googled um, how stressed are we as Americans and I came across this great slide that kind of sums it all up. 65% uh, of Americans are actually losing sleep due to stress. 32% of us are actually losing sleep at least one night per week and about 16% of Americans experience stress-induced in chronic insomnia. So what happens uh, when our body's in stress? Uh, when we perceive some sort of physical or physiologic stress, whether it's real or imagined or not, our body goes into this fight or flight response. We're basically ready to fight the, the stress that's there or run away from it. Um, this is our innate response. Uh, stress hormones are being released, so cortisol levels go up, where heart rate increases, our, our blood pressure increases, our breathing rate increases, our intestinal muscles relax because we really don't need to focus on digestion and what we're, bowel movements are gonna be because we're trying to get over the stressor. Um, we're increasing our blood flow to our muscles because we're trying to get ready to run away from the stimuli. Obviously, this is not an appropriate response to our day-to-day -day problems like traffic jams and work-related issues or relationship conflicts, but um, it is something that's activated multiple times a day. Uh, and when we're not able to turn off the stress response, our body goes into a chronic state of stress. Uh, and we're in this immediate, ultimately ends up affecting our sleep uh, and our ability to fall asleep and stay asleep. Uh, and this is kind of what I was touching upon is the chronic stress. So what can we do to manage our stress and help actually help us fall asleep and stay asleep a little bit better? Uh, meditation is wonderful. Uh, it can relax the body, turn off the stress response, bring sleep a little bit easier. 
uh, simple breathing exercises. So mindful thinking, just sitting down next to the bed on the floor um, or in the bed itself and just uh, focusing and really paying attention to our breathing, uh, inhalation and exhalation, reducing that tension uh, and lowering the stress hormone levels and, and helping um, insomnia. There's a technique called progressive relaxation. Basically what it involves is uh, the patient being aware of all the tension that's in their body and really focusing on each muscle group individually and focusing on how the, the difference between the stressor that they feel in that, in that muscle group and, re and deliberately trying to reduce that tension um, and pay attention to the contrast between the tension and the relaxation and, and, and slowly progressing through their body until all those stress points are, re are, are released. And then the simplest thing that we can do is just pare down our busy schedule. Um, not only are we reducing our stress, but we're making more time for sleep. Before I end, I do wanna focus on what's called sleep hygiene. Uh, sleep hygiene, are it's a list of activities that you can do to improve your sleep so that it's easier for you not to just fall asleep, but also stay asleep. Um, establishing a relaxing routine. So I always think of, tell patients, make sleep almost a ritual in your life. Um, there should be a process. You should be getting ready for sleep. It shouldn't be just like, oh, it's ready for time for bed. I'm just going to rush to bed and get into bed and under covers. There should be a winding down period. You should be actually preparing for it. Uh, taking a warm bath, taking a shower, engaging in quiet activities in that hour before bedtime, whether it be reading, whether it be um, not watching TV um, so and not email. So reading would be great. Uh, lowering the lights, if not dimming the lights. Sometimes I'm as strict as telling patients that their phone should be upside down uh, because there should be no light coming in, no text messages coming in at 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. that they need to be worried about. Um, and then maintaining a regular sleep schedule and as much as possible, maintaining that same schedule on the weekends. Varying it by an hour or so is okay, but trying to keep as much of a, a regular sleep schedule as possible. And then really limiting or avoiding naps altogether. As my patients get older, they prefer, and if they're retired, to take an afternoon nap, and that's okay as long as they're not having insomnia or other sleep issues at night. But for the most part, just avoiding the nap and staying active throughout the day is probably the best thing you can do. And then limiting caffeine use um, bef to before two o'clock under moderation. Uh, limiting your alcohol intake uh, to you know six or seven o'clock or so to one or two drinks. Uh, no more than seven drinks for women and 14 for men. Um, and limiting large or spicy meals or really high carb meals before bedtime. And then limiting your exercise four to six hours before bed. So exercising right before bed is not a good idea. Um, other things that you can do, so we talked about the relaxation techniques, we talked about physical activity, um, or Dr. Bhattach touched upon that. Um, that can help you with stress, but it can also improve your sleep quality just as long as you do it before the four to six hours before going to bed. And then also, um, a lot of patients think, well, I shouldn't eat right before bed. Well, you know, light snacks like nuts, berries, those are okay um, if you need it. A lot of my diabetic patients prefer to have a night snack before they go to bed, and that's, and that's actually uh, not a that thing. And then practicing stimulus control. And this is a, uh, a thing that I teach all my patients when I see them in clinic because a lot of people think that, oh, if I can't go to sleep, I'm just going to lay in bed. I'm just going to toss and turn. I'm going to count sheep. Uh, I'm going to think about what happened during the day or make my to-do list for tomorrow, and then I'll fall asleep. And it just doesn't happen. And this is, what, this is a, a term that we use, and it's called stimulus control therapy. But basically, it, it says, do not go to bed until you are sleepy or tired. Uh, use the bed only for sleep and sex, the two S's, okay? That's all you use it for. Um, not working, not reading, not watching TV, not eating, um, nothing really mentally activating in bed. After you go to bed, if you cannot go to sleep within what you perceive to be 10 or 20 minutes, so that does not mean that you look at the clock and you count when it's been 20 minutes, what you perceive to be 10 or 20 minutes, um, if you can't fall asleep, you get up and out of bed. Um, it's counterproductive to actually stay in bed and trying to force yourself and torture yourself to go back to sleep. What will end up, what will end up happening in most patients is that they develop a negative association with that bed. They've, they've kind of conditioned their mind to think, oh, I know I'm not gonna fall asleep, I know I'm trying, and it just kind of perpetuates that negative thinking. So it's actually better to get up and out of bed 
go to a go to the living room, go to a nice dim room. Um, you can turn on turn on a lamp if you need to, and and do something extremely boring. Uh, that does not mean folding the laundry. That doesn't mean doing finishing the dishes. That doesn't mean reading about you know, a car magazine if you love cars. Nothing that's going to activate your brain. So something extremely boring. Um, listening to soothing music may be okay as well. And then when, you've pre- when you are tired again and sleepy again, that's when you go back to bed. If you go back to bed and you're wide awake, can't go back to sleep, get right back out of bed. Um, and, that's, and that's a really good strategy. And sometimes the patients are like, well, I'll never go to sleep that way. Well, give it a try. You never know. It may actually help. And it's actually been proven to be very beneficial. And then making sure that you get up at the same time every evening. So if that means you went to bed at 11 and you did stimulus control and you didn't actually really fall back asleep till 3, well, that doesn't mean that you can stay in bed till 8 or 9. If your wake-up time is 7, you wake up at 7. Ultimately, what what we're trying to do is reset that circadian rhythm to say, hey, this person is meant to sleep from 11 to 7. And then try, like I mentioned this before, but trying to keep that same schedule on the weekend. That's an excellent question. So the question that he's asking is, is there a difference between the different types of sugar? So the question, if we boil it down to, is there a difference between uh, processed sugar, say high fructose corn syrup, and the type of sugars that we get in fruits and berries and that type of stuff? And the, and the answer to that is definitively yes. There is a difference between sugars, and there's also a difference between calories. There's a difference between everything. I think quality really does matter. Um, and so the types of sugars that we're going to get, and, and actually something really interesting uh, that, that kind of uh, that piggybacks to that is this concept of something called the glycemic index. So the glycemic index of a particular carbohydrate, and sugars are just a form of carbohydrates. Uh, they're one of the simplest forms of carbohydrates. Uh, but the glycemic index is essentially when you when you ingest a particular carbohydrate, how fast does it take for your body to break that down? And the slower it takes to break down, the healthier because you're kind of time releasing the sugar into your system. The processed sugars have a very high glycemic index. So you eat them and they immediately go right into your system and your blood sugar pops right up. But other things that are healthier like um, fresh fruits and vegetables, even honey, those type of things, unprocessed sugar, those type of things have a lower glycemic index, so they get released slowly in your body. Um, I generally tell patients, processed foods, processed sugars, be very cognizant of those, so stuff that's in uh, your soft drinks and sodas and sweets and those type of things. But I think the that the, the types of sugars that you're going to get in fruits and, veg- and mostly fruits are generally good for you. And I wouldn't worry too much about the amount of sugars that you get from that because those are natural sugars. Those are good sugars. Now, if somebody's diabetic and they're insulin and they've got to keep really tight control, that's a different situation. But for the average person, I think generally large consumptions of uh, fruits and, and vegetables are good. And then another question comes up is, so which types of fruits are good, right? Patients always ask, uh, uh, fresh fruits, dried foods, uh, smoothies, you know, all of that stuff. And a recent study came out just kind of looking through those three different types. So the best fruits that you can get are, are fresh fruits, uh, cause the fiber is maintained in that and the fiber is still fairly structurally intact. The next best group of things you, you want to eat fruits, um, and you don't have access to fresh fruits are dried fruits. The fiber is still pretty pretty intact, but uh, you need you know, drink some water, and you know you can kind of balance that out. And then the final fruits, and, and I'm not an anti smoothie person at all. I think smoothies are great, but if you think about smoothies, you're taking all that that fiber and you're grinding it up, and so it's going to be easier to digest through your system, and it's going to keep you full. Uh, last longer. So if you look at those type of things, I think there is a quality difference. And I think that's a really good question regarding the types of uh, types of sugars and how, how your body processes them. So that's an excellent question regarding the sugar substitutes. There is a lot of controversy, I think, in the literature regarding sugar substitutes and people using them long term or not long term. And some of the data is, uh, you know, with respect to what they found in, in, in uh, animal models. I would generally say this, that f- that um, if you don't have diabetes, 
it may not be necessary to, to use the sugar substitutes. But if you do have diabetes, everything's a risk-benefit thing. Everything in medicine, we tell patient, take this pill. It's some sort of balance between risk and benefit, right? And I would say that when it comes to type 2 diabetes, it's probably better to keep your blood sugars under control and have moderate consumption of um, of the sugar substitutes than to go back to eating um on you know um, uh, refined sugars and sugars that high have a high glycemic index because the risks of having your blood sugars are hop, hop higher are much worse. So I would say it's kind of probably a balance between the two. But I'd probably say it's just the same adage. You do, you know if you're going to have one uh, or a couple sodas a week, that's probably okay. But even having several um, uh, sugar free sodas every day is still probably not generally healthy for you. So I think it's just a balance. I haven't been aware of anyone having superior quality than the other, you know. Um, you go to the store, I feel like every time I go to the store, there's a brand new sugar substitute out there. So um, I know that aspartame is probably the one that's been studied the most, but I don't know of any data showing that one's probably better than the other. So the question was that she saw a show on TV that talked about wearing special glasses where you could block out the orange or yellow orange colored lenses. You can block out certain type of rays, um, especially in ultraviolet rays, uh, that may help increase secretion of melatonin and help you, I guess, fall asleep. Um, so I don't really promote special lenses per se. There's a lot of gimmicks on the market. Um, light therapy is a therapy that we use um, in patients that have circadian rhythm disorders. So they have difficulty, either they have advanced sleep phase or they have delayed sleep phase where they're falling asleep too early or falling asleep too late. And the proper timing of light therapy uh, and dark therapy is very important in trying to retrain that rhythm. So I think it's a little bit... Um, misguided if you just wore these lenses at, at a random time in the evening or for three hours in the evening. Um, it really has to be timed properly. And the reason why is because it's really, co it correlates with when you have certain peaks in cortisol or where your body temperature is the lowest, because if you time it inappropriately, you can sometimes worsen the circadian rhythm disorder. So you can Worse than if somebody has a delayed sleep phase and they're going to bed at 2 a.m., if you don't time it properly, you may even shift delay them even more. And then you're having to delay them so much that you retrain them again to come back around. So it gets a little tricky and complicated and it takes a sleep specialist to really do uh, light therapy properly. So the question was, uh, can you comment on the, the relationship between sleep medications and the quality of sleep? Um, I, you know, as a sleep specialist, I give out my fair share of sleep aids. Um, I prefer uh, for patients to try as much as possible natural remedies. Um, so valerian root or melatonin over the counter um, is great. Um, you know, and working on a lot of times with insomnia, the problem is more behavioral uh, and psychophysiological as opposed to a true organic etiology. Um, a lot of times there's um, an underlying sleep disorder. And so really trying to uncover and tease those things out first uh, before just handing out a sleep aid. Now, by no means am I opposed to a sleep aid. Sometimes patients do have organic insomnia. They have ha they've been an insomniac their entire life, ever since they were in their teenager. Um, and sometimes they've perpetuated poor sleep habits, you know, over those years. But in those cases, you know, short-term use of a, a hypnotic or a sedative hypnotic like Ambien, Lunesta, certain antidepressants uh, can be beneficial. But again, the key is short-term use. So three to six months. Um, now, with that said, I do have some patients that have been on a, a, a hypnotic uh, for years. Um, and that's just, they've become kind of dependent on it and can't get off of it. And, and sometimes you have to weigh the pros and cons of, hey, this patient's really not going to sleep at all. Um, they're only getting three hours of sleep. It's really affecting their daytime functioning. They can't go to work. Uh, they're driving, and it's affecting their ability to drive. And so you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons between the two. So the question is uh, regarding what are the most effective therapies for mild cognitive impairment, and what are the newer therapies out there? So, so mild cognitive impairment, just to go back over, is essentially kind of a, a decline in an individual's mental functioning, but it isn't to the level of pure dementia or, or Alzheimer's disease. Now, we know that as, as brain function kind of declines, there are certain interventions that can be helpful. 
as far as new interventions, um, you get into the very interesting uh, uh, controversy in, in the medical literature regarding uh, the use of medications for that. So there's a there's a there's a certain certain set uh, set of medications um, that that are kind of you know popular for that. Aricept is one of those medications, and there's a lot of controversy in the medical literature regarding. Um, the overall effectiveness of those medications. Um, I think some you know, some schools of thoughts feel like that medication can help uh, help slow the rate of decline of mental functioning, but it may not change the end point, which is are you going to be, uh, is an individual is an individual just going to be uh, set at mild cognitive impairment or are they going to eventually get to dementia or not? And then once you have full-blown dementia, the, the medical evidence shows there's no actual benefit to taking those medica- medications once you're already there. I think that's an area of literature and research that we're still trying to wrap our heads around and see what sort of interventions are helpful. But at this phase, I think the only three things that you know really have been shown to be tied and true to be effective are you know increasing social interaction, increasing your exercise, and increasing uh, your mental activity. Now, whether or not that can completely stop something once the train has left the station, I think that's still to be determined. But we definitely know that folks who have any of these kind of compromises do get some benefit from that. But as far as new therapies, I think um, there's still plenty of re- literature and research out there that needs to be done to kind of get a better understanding of that. So the question was, do different people have different circadian rhythms? And is, is it not just the 6 to 10 to 6? And that's true. Yes, everybody functions on a different circadian rhythm. Actually, our circadian rhythm is, uh, it's not actually a 24 hour clock. It's actually a 24.2 hour clock. So this is something you can walk away with and tell people, um, and quiz them. But, uh, yes, people operate on a different circadian rhythm. And that part go, back, goes back to the other question about advanced sleep phase and delayed sleep phase. There are some patients that actually function better if they, and they spend more of their time sleeping in the early morning hours from say 4 AM to 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. and prefer to sleep in the late afternoon or early evening. Um, the problem becomes is it's not socially acceptable. And so we're trying to sometimes force these individuals into a, and conform them into a normal sleep schedule, but it's, it can be very challenging in some patients because their normal circadian rhythm is irregular. Uh, the other problem is that in uh, in patients that are that have dementia or that are mentally handicapped or that have um, sight issues, their circadian rhythms are def- uh, definitely altered because remember, light is the biggest input uh, into your circadian rhythm. So there's any alteration in that light input um, that can definitely alter your circadian rhythm. Well, I think when I see a patient, it's actually trying to find what they prefer their normal sleep schedule to be, where they feel the most comfortable and the most refreshed. Now, there are ways um, where we can measure cortisol through the saliva and doing blood tests for cortisol, looking at body temperature, but it's really hard to do it outside of a research setting because you're really having, I mean, I'd have to monitor somebody's temperature to really pinpoint their perfect circadian rhythm. I'd have to monitor their body temperature every 30 minutes to an hour and look at their cortisol levels and draw them every hour to an hour and really map it out. Uh, but you can do it in a, in a research setting. Uh, it's just difficult to do in a, in a normal clinical setting. So we talked about um, the effects on memory. Uh, cognition is the biggest. Um, also on uh, you know sleep deprivation, we're talking about your, your body's uh, mood, uh, so depression, anxiety can all go hand in hand, um, and then other mood disorders. Uh, as far as health, uh, other health risks, uh, cardiovascular risks, so increased risk of heart disease, heart attacks. Uh, we touched upon um, increased risk of uh, cognitive disorders, so dementia, um, part, certain Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementias are very common. So shift work disorder, uh, very challenging. Uh, so I do see quite a fair share of people. Um, And the the best, and these are patients that are, you know, working two days of nights and then three days and then three days and then two nights and three days. And it varies. And sometimes it's one week of nights and one week of days. Um, The biggest, and there are treatments for shift work disorder. Um, And the biggest, and it's treated somewhat similarly to circadian rhythm disorders. So what I tell patients that are working, say nurses that are working the night shift and are going home in the morning uh, um, is actually light therapy. 
Um, and so that's one of the biggest things. So I have them actually wear dark sunglasses on their drive to uh, drive home to really avoid um, bright light exposure. In Oregon, it's not that big of a deal because it's never bright out. But uh, even then, you're really trying to block all light uh, stimuli. And then um, it's okay in, in, those, in certain situations to actually use a sleep aid in some of those patients because you really need them to conform to it. And sometimes you're having using the sleep aid to to retrain their circadian rhythm um, to sleep during that time period. And then um, the other thing that you can also focus on is, is, is actually giving them stimulants while they're at work. So caffeine intake is actually not is actually useful in those patients um, while they're working during the night. So it sounds like the question that you're asking is, if I wanted to lose weight or, you know, if, if, if my body was a particular shape and, and it became that shape because of some stress induced kind of a situation, is it possible to be able to lose that weight once I kind of make some healthier life choices? And, um, I think that's a very good question. Now, um, that kind of gets to a very interesting topic, which is, which is between weight loss and exercise, um, and so we do know that being overweight or being obese or having, you know, some elevations in your weight can have some negative health consequences. Uh, but we also do know that when we study people who may be overweight but exercise regularly and within reason overweight, mildly overweight and exercise regularly, and people who are thin but don't exercise at all, we actually know that the people who are slightly overweight and exercise more regularly are actually healthier. And the reason behind that is because of the beneficial uh, aspects of exercise. So exercise really normalizes a lot of things. So I would say to that twofold. One, it is possible that once you once – you, uh, uh, identify your stressors, take care of those stressors, that it is possible that you will lose weight and that it will be healthy for you to lose that weight. But I would also counter to that the second thing, which is even if you don't lose a pound, but you exercise 150 minutes a week, all of those things that we talked about earlier, diabetes, heart disease, uh, osteoporosis, depression, all of those things your risk is still going to be significantly less even if you don't lose a pound. So I think the idea of exercising and losing weight is still helpful, but the idea is get the exercise piece down first, let the weight loss happen afterwards because I think I still do think there is some benefit to healthy healthy diet and and exercise and possibly losing weight. But take that first step and then after that first step the other things should follow, but even if they don't, you'll still be in a much healthier place than you were before. So the question was, what causes restless legs? Well, you're in luck because I just gave a huge talk last week on restless legs. But uh, there's two theories. Uh, the two main implications behind restless legs is one, a deficiency in iron, and two, a deficiency in dopamine in the brain. The dopamine is the same compound that we see a deficiency of in, say, Parkinson's disease. Uh, but the mechanisms are different. Um, so that dopamine deficiency uh, basically impacts your perception of these abnormal, you know, discomfort, internal discomfort in the legs and your constant urge to move the legs. Um, the, the, Iron deficiency, I think, is related to the dopamine deficiency because iron is actually a cofactor in the synthesis uh, and formation of dopamine in the brain. Uh, so I think indirectly, uh, iron deficiency can lead to restless legs. There's also certain medical conditions that have been correlated with restless legs, and we don't exactly know what the correlation is. But for example, patients with kidney disease, so patients that are on dialysis have a huge incidence of restless legs. Uh, patients with certain types of neuropathies or nerve damage, uh, whether it be to diabetes or other conditions, have a higher incidence of restless legs. Um, and so when I see a patient with this, the classic symptoms of restless legs, so there's usually a, a criteria of four things. One is this internal sensation, constant urge to move your legs. It can be described various different ways. Some patients may say that it feels like worms in their legs. It feels like answer crawling. Uh, so it's just a deep ache. They can't describe it sometimes. Um, two is that it occurs predominantly in the evening. It's worse in the evening. And three is that it's uh, worse with act with uh, with when they're sedentary or when they're relaxed. Um, and again, that kind of goes with the evening. And then the fourth criteria is that it's relieved by activity. 
So the patients are having to get up, walk around, uh, massage, stretch their legs to really get relief. And that's kind of, it's a clinical diagnosis. And the first, as far as blood tests, the biggest thing I'm looking for, I always do um, check for iron deficiency. Uh, even if patients are not anemic, uh, sometimes their iron stores can be low and it, it's easy to enough to replete. And uh, especially in patients that have kind of episodic symptoms, it may just be as low as, uh, it may just be as simple as that they're iron deficient and we can easily fix that. And then there are medications and the medications that we do have uh, are geared towards increase, the main medications are uh, geared towards increasing the uh, efficacy of dopamine in the brain. So basically uh, working on the dopamine receptors in the brain. There has been a link between opioids, um, so you're talking about your Vicodins, your Percocets, and things like that, and opioid receptors in restless legs, but that hasn't quite been um, elucidated, uh, and it hasn't been tweaked uh, quite yet. Uh, but we do use opioids sometimes in severe cases of restless legs. So uh, alcohol... Uh, the way I would look at it is the amount of time that somebody's using it and the, uh, the quantity of alcohol. Alcohol is a direct neurotoxin. Um, it actually can cause um, visible brain atrophy. So when we do an MRI in somebody who's been an alcoholic for 10 years, you're actually seeing shrinkage of brain tissue. Um, it actually, And it's not just your central nervous system, but also your peripheral nervous system. So you're talking about your spinal cord and nerves. Uh, we can actually see problems as, as far as neuropathy or nerve damage from long-term alcohol use. Uh, but the cognitive effects, um, depending on the duration of use, uh, for the most part can be reversible. But there, I think as time goes on and the person's been drinking, say, and I can't give you an exact year, number of years, but you know, say five or 10 years, some of those uh, cognitive deficits are hard to recover because the brain has already gone through atrophy. Um, the other thing that you really focus on with alcohol abuse is uh, cerebellar function. So your cerebellum is responsible for your balance um, and tremors and refinement of motor movements. So a lot of chronic alcoholics uh, may have cerebellar dysfunction long term as well. I can't speak to calcium, but magnesium um, has been implicated. And magnesium is actually one of another cofactor, kind of like iron, in the synthesis of dopamine. Um, and there are Magnesium sometimes is used commonly also with leg cramps or nocturnal leg cramps in patients that have cramps at night. And sometimes leg cramps and restless legs can go in hand in hand. Um, and so there, definitely with mag I do use magnesium and recommend that in some patients who have you know not so severe symptoms and they want natural remedies. Um, the other things I tell patients about is just sometimes tonic water. It's great for cramps and may help with restless legs. Um, pickle juice um, sometimes works. And then I had a patient who came in and was telling me about drunken raisins, which I never ever heard of. So I had to Google it, but apparently it's raisins dipped in gin um, and it help, and it apparently works like a charm. So I learned something new, um, but yeah, I'm drunken raisins. So I can speak from this the sleep standpoint, um, cortisol can definitely affect your sleep latency. So the, the amount of time that it takes you to actually fall asleep. Uh, it can also increase your uh, sleep or worsen sleep maintenance issues. So it's increasing your number of awakenings in the middle of the night. And it may actually prolong the number of awakenings uh, depending on how high your cortisol levels are. Uh, because remember, the minute that you start seeing that up rise of cortisol, that's your body's signal to wake up. Um, so if you're having these constant surges while that cortisol is slowly increasing and rising by 6 a.m., you're causing poor sleep, poor sleep efficiency um, uh, overall and, and poor sleep consolidation. So the question was about sleep apnea and whether CPAP is the standard of care or are there other th th therapies. CPAP, which stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. Um, so we're, what we're doing is we're taking air, filtering it, and forcing it at a certain pressure. Uh, because what's happening with sleep apnea patients is that they're having a collapse of their upper airway. And so we're trying to keep use that air pressure to keep the airway open. And the CPAP is the gold standard of care for moderate to severe sleep apnea. Um, that's what I tell my patients. For mild to moderate sleep apnea, other options are available, and even for severe, if the patient is not tolerant to CPAP. Um, the, the things that the two mainstays of treatment are dental appliances. So this is where you would go to a dentist and they would fit you and custom make a dental appliance for you where, with the, and the theory behind it is that what you're doing is putting traction on the lower jaw and pulling that lower jaw forward a little bit by millimeters at a time. But when the tongue, when the, when the jaw comes forward, your tongue will come forward with it, and that keeps you from 
relaxing that tongue and blocking the airway and causing that obstruction. The other uh, treatment that's available is surgically. Um, a surgical treatment. Uh, and the two main surgeries, the first is actually mandibular advancement surgery. So we're basically talking about permanently advancing that jaw forward. What the dental appliance is doing, but doing it permanently. So here you're seeing an oral maxillofacial surgeon and they do various uh, x-rays and studies to see if you'd be a good candidate. You have to have good jaw laxity to really see if there's going to be an improvement. But they're basically, again, advancing your jaw millimeters um, uh, at a time and they're just looking and they're going to uh, move that tongue forward with it. Uh, and that's going to help open up the airway. And it can be very beneficial, especially in my younger patients who really don't want to sleep with CPAP because it's not attractive um, and, and want something more permanent. The other surgery is called uvulopallidopharyngeoplasty, or UPP. And so what they're doing is going in and basically taking out all that excess tissue that you don't need, so tonsils, uvula, which is just an accessory, um, and then uh, working on the soft palate, if need be, uh, shaving part of it, and just making that upper airway opening bigger um, so that you've got good airflow. Uh, and those are two options. There is a new option on the market, and I don't love it, um, uh, but I'm not speaking against it, and it's called EPAP therapy. So it's not CPAP, but EPAP. Uh, and it's you generating your own pressures. And the way it works is that you wear these little Band-Aid looking plugs on your nostrils and you stick them on and they have little valves in them. You breathe in just fine through those valves. Um, and as long as you keep your mouth closed, um, and when you try to exhale out, most of those valves will close. And so you're only escaping a little bit of air. And so that trapped air is you just generating your own pressure. So as you breathe more and have more um, inhalation, exhalation phases, you're increasing that pressure. And that pressure of air is keeping your airway from collapsing. The other theory behind it is that because you're not exhaling all that carbon dioxide, that increased carbon dioxide is actually telling your brain, oh, wow, like, well, you're not breathing. What's going on? I need to, and, you know, I, need to, I need to kick it into high gear. And so your brain is kind of helping prevent those apneas or pauses in your breathing. And that's kind of the theory behind it. It can, um, it's about $2 a night for those little strips that I'm talking about. Do need a prescription for it. The company advocates this as being very effective for severe sleep apnea. I have yet to have a severe sleep apnea patient benefit from it um, or find them to be very helpful. Um, I have used it in some just primary snoring disorder uh, in patients that oh, don't, have, don't have sleep apnea and just have snoring and they find it to be beneficial. It's hard to get insurance to pay for it, though. So the first question is about Tai Chi, and if Tai Chi counts for a moderate form of exercise, and the answer is absolutely yes. So there has been lots, actually, there's been a lot of studies just recently about Tai Chi and the effects that it has on the body, and there is no doubt that it has significant effects improving the circulation, improving the coordination, the flexibility, and uh, I think there's no doubt that that not only counts, but there's also uh, evidence to show that it, it does have some unique advantages to the body, and I would highly encourage that. So I don't have a clear answer for you because I'd have to talk to you a little bit more and get more history from you uh, to really truly understand what's keeping you from falling asleep, what's keeping you you know, staying awake or wake, waking you up in the middle of the night. Um, and there's various strategies we could look at. We, could, we talked about stimulus control therapy. Uh, there's ways that I work with patients where I actually work on sleep restriction. Um, so I, ex I severely limit their sleep before I improve their sleep. Uh, and sleep restriction therapy takes one-on-one -on -one time for us to sit here and calculate exact and keep a sleep diary. So it's a little bit more time consuming for me to do it. And I actually see my patients that I'm doing sleep restriction therapy on once a week because I have to keep tabs on them um, or else they just can't do it at home uh, because we're calculating your sleep efficiency and trying to reset your circadian rhythm. Um, with that said, uh, there's always a role for uh, for sleep aids if need be uh, temporarily to help with that process. Um, but I worry about sleep aids with patients with sleep apnea because remember all these hypnotics and sedative hypnotics are depressants of the central nervous system. And so you were, if they're depressing the central nervous system, they're also affecting your muscle tone and they can actually worsen your sleep apnea. I worry less about that in patients who are being treated for their sleep apnea with your CPAP, um, but it is a concern that I worry about.